today we're going to be presenting uh, ACMG guidelines and how to use them in an automated fashion within the Nexus clinical software using its VIA system. Our presenter today is Dr. Andrea O'Hara, and I will pass it on to her so we can get started. Dr. O'Hara. Thank you. So as Shalini mentioned, I'll be presenting an automated approach for enforcement of ACMG standards and guidelines for use with CNV analysis. Specifically, I'll be addressing what are the standards and guidelines recommended by ACMG, what tools can we use to apply these rules in a systematic manner for our clinical samples, and then carry those through to the final report, which has additional recommendations and guidelines by ACMG. So to get started, what is ACMG? ACMG is the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. It's an organization comprised of laboratory and healthcare professionals um, who are committed to the practice of medical genetics. They work as a group to develop and sustain genetic and genomic initiatives in clinical and laboratory practice, education, and advocacy. Um, and today we'll be focusing on some of the guidelines they've set in place for our clinical practice with regards to copy number variation. So ACMG has defined a copy number variant as a segment of DNA that is at least 1 KB in size that differs as compared to a reference genome. The term CNV itself does not imply clinical significance. As such, we need to qualify it as being pathogenic or benign, likely benign, likely pathogenic, or of unknown significance for clinical relevance. So we need to use both of these metrics in order to um, assess copy number variation in an individual. ACMG has set up evaluation guidelines for us to use um, when we have a region. So once a region is things to consider, things for us to consider when calling a CNV. A lot of these rules are still at the lab's discretion. So, for example, we have familiarization with well-established contiguous gene syndromes. This is um, using the knowledge of recurrent and clinically established deletions and duplications. Consideration of CNV size. This is it really at lab discretion. Um, any size restriction for the inclusion of a CNV based on laboratory consideration. Consideration of genomic content in the CNV interval. Things with a reported pathogenic mutation in medical literature are going to be weighted more heavily than genes with no reported mutations versus genes with or in regions with no genes whatsoever. If there is no genomic content and the interval is of a certain size, we may choose not to include it in our report altogether. And finally, comparison of CNV with both internal and external databases. Um, this includes taking into consideration dosage um, in the reported population studies, so gain versus loss, size of the CNV reported relative to the size of the CNV in question, um, and we'll get back to this in a moment, sex of an individual in the database versus the relative sex of a patient, so for example, for an excellent X-linked disease, uh, were they male or female in our reference, and is our subject male or female? The validity of the CNV reported in a general population database, is it conflicting reports, is it consistent, um, how many samples have been reported? And finally, the clinical characterization of normal individuals. As we know, this is sometimes a bit of a relative term, and so do we feel confident that this is truly representative of a normal population, or is this really not as reliable? Um, as one would hope. And once we've established a region, we want to know how do we qualify it. So uh, we can qu qualify it based on pathogenic. This means that it's been identified in multiple um, peer-reviewed publications as being clinically significant. Um, and this is going to include, include most cytogenetically visible alterations of 3 to 5 megabases. Again here, this is going to be a bit subjective on size, so there are going to be lab-based distinctions based on what they use as a size cutoff. Likely pathogenic, clinically significant in one publication or case report, but not necessarily multiple case reports. Um, and, and or is there a gene within the interval that has a compelling gene function that's relevant, but may be less unknown. Likely benign, there's no genes reported, but it exceeds a certain size parameter. Again, these are going to be lab-based um, parameters. Um, it may have been described in a small number of cases um, in a general population, but doesn't have a lot of volume behind it for us to know for sure that it's benign. 
unknown significance. These are regions that contain genes, but we don't know if these genes have any dosage sensitivity. Or if we have something that's very contradictory, so there's no firm conclusions regarding clinical significance. And finally, we have benign results, and this is typically going to be our um, common CMV polymorphisms. ACMG defines a common polymorphism as a CMV that's been documented in at least 1% of the population. Now, both our categories for significance and our guidelines for calling are a bit subject to interpretation, both um, between different labs and then also among our own lab um, to help get past this subjectivity and also just the laborious uh, interpretation process that's going to go along with all of this, we want to use an automated approach that's going to speed up review and also increase reliability between cases. To use this, we're going to use an automated tool in NX Clinical, our Variant Interpretation Analysis, or VIA, system. This reviews all our calls and then pre-classifies them according to set rules. Pre-classification does not eliminate the need for personnel review, but rather streamlines the process um, to help us get started with our first round of results. So let's look at an example of an evaluation interpretation of a single CNV using our different ACMG rules. So the first rule we're going to consider is our internal databases, so our own legacy samples. Um, and we're doing this in the context of benign variants or um, known artifacts that we often see in our arrays. So we have a variant in question, and our first question we're going to ask is, is this novel or new? Is this a, a new change or something that we commonly see in our databases um, among a normal population or something that's not known to be pathogenic? If it's not novel, it's something that's uh, normal, we can classify it as previous based on our similarity. So we are going to use a similarity score for this rule. <clears throat> the similarity score works as follows. We have an event that's in question, so here this is the top event, and then at the bottom here we have our known CNV. This is, can be something that was called in other samples in our database um, for this example here. We're going to calculate a simula similarity score of A, area of overlap, versus B, total area across the two regions. As an example, if we have our reported event, and that's one megabase long, and we have our CNV that's one megabase long, and they have the exact same start and ends, our similarity score is 1 over 1 or 1 1.0. Perfectly similar, these are the same event in multiple samples. We could have our reported event being one megabase, but our entire CNV is two megabases, so our start and end points are significantly different in our uh, database. Our similarity is going to be 1 over 2 or 0 0.5, so not nearly so similar in terms of scoring. <clears throat> our reported event could be much longer than the other CNVs that have been reported. So our, uh, our event is one megabase and previous reported have been 0 0.5 and our similarity score again is 0 0.5. When we take into consideration all of these different cases, we want to consider those that are highly similar. So typically 0 0.95, 95% or greater. Um, this is an adjustable parameter, but we want to look for things that really are extremely similar and their start and end points. So if they have a very similar start and end point as other, uh, call other regions in our database that have already been classified as a benign or artifact, we can classify the same as such. So we're able to very easily filter out these common um, polymorphisms that we frequently see in our results. What if it's not uh, something that's common, it's something that's novel? Then we might want to consider um, our change based on the size. We know from our guidelines and standards that variants of a certain size um, should, be should be classified as pathogenic. Here I'm saying 10 megabases. We know that we want to report things above a certain size. However, we do sometimes want to consider um, the genic involvement, but over a certain size we're just going to report it because it's going to be um, cytogenetically relevant. So here I'm saying greater than 10 megabases, I want to immediately classify this as pathogenic. This is going to be too big to be considered non-pathogenic. What if it's smaller than 10 megabases? Now I might want to consider comparison to some external databases. Before, when we were looking at our benign and artifacts, we are looking at internal samples, but let's look at some external examples. So we have our variant. We've decided that it's novel. It's less than 10 megabases. Is it similar to anything that we've seen in ClinGen or Decipher? 
To use this, we're going to again use our similarity score where we are going to compare our region, the overlapping area, with a previously reported region of interest. So again, we have a ClinGen event um, that's so long and then our particular CMB, our similarity score is one. We have <clears throat> a reported ClinGen event that's much smaller than ours. Our similarity score is going to drop. It has different coordinates. Or if our um, our, our event is larger, sorry, it's smaller than the reported ClinGen event, <clears throat> again, we're not going to have that similarity score. So here we're really focusing on areas that are highly similar to other previously reported cases in the ClinGen databases. What are all the databases that we're actually assessing here? <clears throat> it's actually a number of databases, so this is going to include Decipher, which has um, a number of known syndromes. And ClinGen, we have got three different databases to look at. We have a dosage sensitivity database, the um, fixed published postnatal data set, and then the recent submission data set where we're able to um, add in new information on a daily basis to be assessed and added in for comparison. Each of these databases is further broken down into the types of change, gains or losses, and then into the classification of those changes. So is it considered pathogenic, likely pathogenic, likely benign, benign, or of unknown significance? And using all of these databases with these classifications and a high level of similarity, we're able to classify any other changes that have been previously reported and maintain that reporting. What if it's still not similar to these? We have something that's still unknown. Well, now we can consider the genomic content of the area. So we have a variant. It's novel for us. It's not something that's a common polymorphism we typically see. It's smaller than 10 megabases. It's not been found in ClinGen or Decipher. Now we might want to look at DGV. Um, DGV is a database of genomic variants. These are typically germline polymorphisms. We do anticipate that for the most part we'll be able to pick these up in a reliable way, but sometimes we do encounter um, variants that we haven't detected before due to the genetic makeup of that individual. So we want to compare to DGV to see if we can call it benign. To do this, we're going to use the DGV similarity score. This is slightly different than our traditional similarity score. We have our current CNV case, which is showing us a blue gain, and then we have DGV cases. Some are losses, some are gains. They have different start and end coordinates. We're going to score the event based on the directionality, so scoring gains as a higher weight versus loss, the similarity score, again, how similar are start and end points, as well as the number of reported cases. And all of these are going together to give us our DGV similarity score. We'll scale these similarity based on the reported cases and then pick the highest score as our DGV score. As an example, if we have an area where it is 100% similar between our current CNV and DGV, but there's only one case that has reported it, we'll get a DGV score of 0.67. If we have uh, our current CNV and DGV cases with 100% similarity, but it's in 200 cases, well, now we have a DGV score of 0.99. We're very confident that this is a common polymorphism. Uh, conversely, we could have an area that has sort of a mixed similarity. It's about 90%. They have slightly different start and end points, but we have it in about 50 cases. And here we're going to see a DGV score of about 88%. Um, our happy medium is sort of somewhere in between. We want to capture things that are going to think, catch reliable um, results, but not necessarily things that have only been found in maybe one other individual. So by default, we have this set to capture things at about 85% um, similarity. So if we have something that's highly similar, we're going to capture it as being benign. But what if it's not similar to DGV either? It's still something different. Well, then we might want to ask about the actual content of that region. Is it intergenic or intronic? If there's nothing there, if there's no axons, nothing that's really going to be affecting the coding region, well, then we might want to consider that to be likely benign. But what if it does have exonic regions? Well, then we might want to see if this has any overlap to other gene sets of interest, for example, our OMIM morbid gene list. So here, instead of using similarity, we're going to be using overlap. We have an OMIM gene. We have our CNV. It overlaps 100%. We know that we are going to want to interrogate it. We have a CNV that's bigger. 
it's still going to cover this OMIM gene. We only have 50% overlap, but it's hitting our OMIM gene. Or we have an area that's much smaller. So it's, the OMIM gene completely covers it. We have 100% overlap. It's still hitting our OMIM gene. When we are talking about overlap, a lot of times we just want to know if it overlaps because we're looking at a gene of interest and as long as it's hitting an exon in that gene, we want to interrogate it. Overlap is useful for detecting overlapping events. Does the CNV overlap any coding region of an OMIM morbid gene? And if it does, let's call this a VU because we want to look at it with more detail or maybe we don't know how it's going to affect, um, affect the area, but we do know that that is a gene that does have an impact. Okay, so keeping all these rules in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at some case examples. So I'm going to go ahead and launch NX Clinical. When I first launch the software, I need to log in. <clears throat> this is um, not an ACMG, ACMG guideline, but better um, a standard of practice that we log in so that all of our edits, all of our changes, everything that we do is recorded by a user. This way we know when we make an assessment who's made that change, who's made that edit, who's made that call, and also who has signed out the cases. Now when we're ready to begin, <clears throat> we can go ahead and pick our samples. We can do an open search and see everything that's in our database, or we can specify what we want to see. We can specify this by sample type. Here we're going to focus on postnatal cytoscan samples. We have 26. We can focus it on our workflow. I want to see everything that's been completed its initial review and is now ready for a more thorough review. Or we could search based on the name if we had a particular sample in mind. Today we're going to go over three different affected cases. These are all individuals that have a series of known phenotypic um, issues. Uh, all of these are affymetric cytoscan samples. They were run in a postnatal processing with a constitutional settings. And we pre-classified them, again, using our VIA variant interpretation analysis tool with a postnatal setting. This postnatal pre-classification is set up to follow the ACMG guidelines, um, as I just went over. We can see here our gender for the sample. If I've added phenotypic information, that's also included. And we also have a snapshot of the calls in that sample. So we can see benign, likely benign, unknown significance, likely pathogenic, pathogenic, artifact, unclassified, and if there was any allele calls that need to be addressed. We can see the affected case one has one pathogenic call, no likely pathogenic. Case two has no likely pathogenic or pathogenic calls. And case three has one pathogenic call. Again, these have only been pre-classified. We still need to do the final review and classification to see if we agree with these results. So to get started, we'll click on our case sample. All right, so affected case one is shown here. At the top, we can see an overview of all of the chromosomes. We will see our changes up here. We have red for loss, blue for gain. At the bottom, we have a table of our results. You can see that we have a total of 17 events showing up, most of which are classified. Um, if we want to look at a change in more detail, we can either click on it here and have, pull it up, or we can look at it down at our table at the bottom. If we go down to our table at the bottom, we can see the sort of the heart of the results here. We have our type of change. Is it loss? Is it gain? Is there an allele call that um, we need to note? We have our chromosomal region with genomic coordinates, the cytoband, ISCN nomenclature, length of the change, gene count, that's the number of genes. Right now, I'm not showing the list of the genes that is in here, but I can customize this to add the actual list of genes as well. I have our DGV similarity score. Again, this is looking at not only similarity, but the number of samples that have been reflected, the number of publications, and giving me a weighted score based on that. Our classification, right now these are our pre-classification results. I have something here called evidence score, which I'll get to in a moment, and then our notes. So I'm going to sort these first based on our classification. We can see here that we have got four um, results that have not been classified, and then a number that are pre-classified. Uh, a good standard of practice is for us to actually review all of these calls, not just those that have, been that have not been classified. So we can go ahead and click through these pre-classified results. We'll be able to see, if we hover over the notes, why this has been pre-classified. So this is extremely similar to the ClinGen prenatal benign losses. 
Similarly, we have a number that are uh, have the similar result because of the prenatal benign losses. And so we can click through and see if we agree with the calling, agree with the reasoning. We have some that were called because they were similar to previous reported cases. These ones were reported because they are similar to um, other, other parameters. So here we have that is uh, overlapping with RefSeq, but it does not contain genes. Um, if we go through, we can see all of our results. We have one that's considered pathogenic. If we click on this one, it's been classified as pathogenic because it's greater than 10 megabases. We can see, in fact, it's 35 megabases, so quite large. We also have a number of calls here at the top, four, that did not get pre-classified. And so we can look at each of these in more detail. So our first call is on chromosome Y. This is a male sample. We can see here, if we click on our drop-down box, that it has been called in some samples before, but not all of them have been classified, and it hasn't been classified with any regularity. We see two were classified as artifacts, one was classified as being benign, and one was not classified. Um, because it hasn't met our threshold for the number of samples for our auto preclassification, and we do have some inconsistency, I'm going to need to manually classify this. So I'm going to go into edit mode here, start editing the sample, and classify this as being artifact. Next, I have another call on the Y chromosome. And again, this is similar that we see there's other samples that have this change. Here we only have one. We already classified it as an artifact in this other sample, and I'm going to maintain that calling for this as well. You can see that after I classify it over here in the notes section, we're able to see that I, in fact, am the one that classified it as an artifact. It's going to have my name on it and the timestamp of when I did this. This is going to be maintained throughout this sample forever. So if somebody else comes back to look at it, they will know that I was the one that classified this as an artifact at this date and this time. Okay, now we have two other areas that look to be of interest. We have one on chromosome 5. I see that it's new for my database. I have no other samples that have this call. Um, I can look here in, my, um, in some of my sort of helpful tracks here. I can look in DGB and see if it's been reported before. Looks like there are some gains for this area. There are no decipher syndromes here. There are no omen morbid genes. There are some ClinGen um, pathogenic or likely uh, pathogenic changes here. They look to be quite a bit longer than what I'm seeing. Um, but I would like to have more confidence that this is not impacting my um, phenotype. Furthermore, I really haven't added phenotype information here. I do have the option in NX Clinical of adding in phenotype information. If I click on this info button right here, I can edit the sample info. So here I can edit my display name and I can also add phenotype information. The phenotype information that we're going to be adding is HPO uh, terminology phenotypes. HPO is the Human Phenoty Phenotype Ontology Database. This is a database that has a standardized vocabulary of phenotypic abnormalities encountered in human disease. This means that it's a set, um, it's a set group of words and terms that we can use to identify things. This is not going to be just an open keyword. It is not going to be an open typing um, column. We're going to actually search based on keywords and select areas. When we select our specific terms, we will have genes that are associated with these phenotypes that will link it. And we'll be able to flag regions that have linked genes of interest after we've added in our HPO phenotypes. So inclusion of the phenotype will link us to genes. If those genes are hit, we will get um, a note, and we will know that something that may be of greater interest for us. So let's give this a try. For this particular individual, we have got um, four different phenotypic um, indicators. When we type this in here, we can search by our HPO term or by keywords. I'm going to do keywords. Our first was intrauterine growth retardation. I can type in that whole mouthful, or I can just go for growth retardation. I do want to spell it right. And I see here I have intrauterine growth retardation and postnatal. So I'm going to pick intrauterine. My next keyword here is failure to thrive. And I can see here I have got just a generic failure to thrive that I'm going to pick. We do have some further um, dis descriptions. I don't know if one of these is uh, a better fit, so I have to go with the information I have, which is just general failure to thrive. I have a ventricular septal defect. 
So, and here, when I type in septal defect, I have ventricular septal defect is one that comes up. So I'm going to go ahead and pick that one. And then the last one I have is microcephaly. And here I have a generic microcephaly. Again, if I had more information, I could pick which type of microcephaly. If I don't know, I can pick the generic microcephaly term. And then I'm going to hit apply. When I do that, we see here all four of these terms with their HPO terms are added in here. And I'm going to click Save Changes. Now, as I do that, our evidence score is going to update, and we'll be able to see those changes. Now we can see here that we had one area that pulled up, not our area on chromosome 5. We can also see here we have a DGV score of 0.79. Now as you'll recall, the DGV is going to be based on both the similarity to the cases, the number of cases, um, and um, the how many are gains versus losses. A 0.79, close to 0.8, it's not high enough to capture it automatically, but it's pretty close. I'm fairly confident that this is a benign artifact. I'm not 100% sure, so I'm going to classify this as being likely benign. And that's simply because um, I did see a few ClinGen areas that had, um, that had overlap here with some morphological phenotypes. They did appear to be longer, um, so I'm not 100%, but fairly certain. I also have this region here on chromosome 7 that was not classified. I can see it's actually very close to another loss. If I resort my table based on chromosome region, I can see both of these back to back. And I can see here I have a small region of loss next to a larger region of loss. <clears throat> if I zoom in here, I can see that I have this it's a somewhat non-contiguous break. This could be a true break, or it could just be a blip in our segmentation. If I look at my B allele frequency, I can see that in this area, it looks to be fairly consistent in its calling. It's still below my threshold of being uh, baseline normal. Um, so I think that this is something that should be connected together. I do have the option to edit this call. I can just take my end and pull it into the next one. And I'm going to modify this change. And now it's going, to pre it's going to run through my script and pre-classify it again after it's joined them together. And when it's done, we will see now that we have got one region. It still has my evidence score. And it's now going to be classified as being pathogenic. There we go. And so we can see here that it's now pathogenic. It's one region. We still have this evidence score of 8. Now, this evidence score is going to indicate um, our overlap with the HPO terminology. So if I hover over it, it's showing me that there are eight genes that go with specific HPO terms I put in. So we can see there are several that match with microcephaly and several that match with failure to thrive. <clears throat> this fits our phenotype well, and it appears that this is going to be the pathogenic variant that's affecting this individual. Now, after I've classified all my areas, um, I'm happy with the pre-classification, then I'm ready to move on to my next sample. So I'm going to go back over here and look at my affected case 2. This case has nothing pre-classified as being pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Again, I have my results at the top. I can see my losses in red, my gains in blue. I don't see any large changes here um, by my naked eye. Um, but I can still take a closer look at these. I'm going to go ahead and start editing this sample because I'm going to be taking some notes. Um, if I click on my classification here, I can see what has or has not been classified. I have an area on chromosome 12 that has a DGB similarity score of 0.74. So it's not great. It's not terrible. Not good enough for us to pre-classify it. But I can see here that this is a fairly recurrent copy number event. In fact, 13 out of 50 samples have matched this event. If I look at it, I can see that many are classified as being, um, as being benign, but not all. So I'm going to go ahead and classify this one as benign. Again, it's going to show that I was the one that manually classified it at this date and this time. We still have um, one other area that has not been classified. And that's here on chromosome um, 22. It's a bit longer for a change. It's one megabase, almost two. Not long enough to be automatically classified as pathogenic. We can see here that our DGV similarity score is quite low. So it's not very similar to anything in DGV. We did add phenotype information. This individual had several different morphologic issues. Nothing came up, though, in terms of our HPO evidence score.
So here we can look at some of our other information. So we can look into Cypher to see if there's any Decipher genes. We can actually see it's pretty much right cut out of here. There are no Decipher syndromes in this area. If we look at our Omen morbid genes, we have a handful of Omen morbid genes, um, not a bunch. If we look at our postnatal pathogenic, we do see two gains right here, and I can actually scroll down and see there's a few more that are associated with developmental delay and or morphological phenotypes. As I mentioned, this person has um, morphological issues, so I think that this is my likely pathogenic event. I don't have a specific gene here that would target that, so I'm going to classify it as likely pathogenic as opposed to entirely pathogenic. Um, and, and I'm going to check here. I check all the rest of mine to make sure I agree with these calls. <clears throat> and if I feel happy with the pre-classification, I can leave it as is. If I want to change a pre-classification, let's say one of these that is listed as being likely benign, I really believe to be is just a benign event, I do have the option here, for example, this one that's been classified in 15 samples, I do have the option of overwriting it. And I can say I want to change that to be benign, and it will mark it as such. Once I'm done reviewing this case, I can go ahead to my next case, case three here, affected sample three. Again, this is another male sample. This one already has our phenotype information added. We have failure to thrive, delayed motor development, and delayed speech and language development. If we take a look at the top here, it looks like we have one slightly larger loss over here on chromosome 22, but otherwise a lot of small losses and gains, overall relatively quiet. We can again look at our table down here, and we can see our changes and look at our classifications. We have one that was not classified on the Y chromosome. If I click on this, I can see that it is a gain that was called in some samples, but not a lot. I have two that were classified as artifact, one as benign, one that was not classified. Um, I can add this as an artifact, and oh, I can change to edit mode and then classify this as an artifact. As I add more artifacts, as I add more benign samples, future samples that are added in will be able to take this information and grow from it. So once I have five or six artifacts here, another sample that has this region will automatically call it as an artifact based on our VIA system that we talked about earlier. Okay, I can also take a look now at all of our remaining issues. I see I have one here that was listed as pathogenic. It has an evidence score of 11, meaning there's 11 um, different genes here that are associated with our phenotype, and this includes our delayed speech, failure to thrive, um, as well as um, some cranial dysfunction. If I look up here, I can see that it also is one that has an adjacent copy number event. So I can zoom in and see if I want to join these together, and I do. I can click and drag and cut them across. We can see here that there was an allelic imbalance call associated with it, and we'll say, do you want to match these together? And I'm going to say yes. We also can look at our um, examples here to see if this has been classified. Now, we have this one as being classified not based on length. It was based on similarity to a postnatal pathogenic losses. And so if I click down here on this track, I can actually visualize these. And you can see here there's a number of losses that cover our area that are associated with developmental delay, failure to thrive, and morphological phenotypes. So it looks like this is a really confident um, assessment of our change. Let's go ahead and... There we go, we can see this in better detail if I zoom out just a little bit. So you can see that we have global developmental delay, failure to thrive here, delayed speech. Oop, if I scroll a little slower, we have some delayed speech here. So we're able to see all of the changes that we have. Once I've finished my assessment of all these samples, I've classified everything, I've agreed with the assessments, I've made adjustments as needed, I can go ahead and now generate our final report. Now, ACMG also has guidelines based on our report. We need to include in our report our reporting criteria or a description of the criteria used to review the data. So this is any CNV size restrictions. Was there anything that I automatically threw out because I decided it was not big enough to be assessed? 
Were there any criteria used for the inclusion or exclusion from our CNV report? Am I going to report everything or am I not going to include things that may be benign, common polymorphisms, artifacts, things of this nature? I need to make a note so that way they know what is all being included in this assessment. For the changes that I am reporting, I need to include our cytogenetic location, our dosage, so is it a gain or a loss, the actual CNV size, and the coordinates along with the genome build. So all of the specifics about it. And then finally, all of the genes that are in that interval. You'll recall that in my table I was just showing the number of genes, but I can customize my report to include the list of genes. I can also add that gene list to the table if I so choose. And then finally, a statement of clinical significance, so our interpretation of the results, and then any recommendations for appropriate clinical follow-up. So let's take a look at how we can generate this report in NX Clinical. <clears throat> After I've finished my assessment of a sample, I'm going to go ahead and call it complete, so that way I know that I've reviewed it. I can click on my Generate Report button, and I have generated an ACMG-specific report that fulfills all of these guidelines. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's going to generate a copy of all of the results that are considered reportable for us. So at the top here, I'm going to have my sample name, my ISCN nomenclature, an overview of my sample. I will have some of the, you know, uh, nitty-gritty probe pictures. Here I have all my sample attributes. This is going to include my phenotype information, my settings used. Any just anything that I use to um, include or exclude information. And then I'm going to have my individual calls. And again, I can choose to show everything. I can include to show benign, likely benign. I can say I just want to show pathogenic in here. And that is up to me to decide. Once I have generated this report, I can save PDF. I can use it to um, upload into our system. I can cut and paste out of this if I have another format that I'd like but I can use this as a report to follow the ACMG guidelines. Now, after I've finished my review, I've generated my report, I can go ahead and stop editing the sample. I can also choose if I want to lock the sample, and this means that it cannot be edited anymore. This sample is done, I've signed it out, nothing has changed. And I can do this for all the samples. I can decide whether or not I want to lock a case or if I just want to close it. I can leave it as being unreviewed if I want to come back to it again. I'm always going to go out of edit mode when I'm done with it so that I'm able to see everything um, that I've finished and let other people use it. I changed my workflow over here because, again, these are all now direct review completed. I took them out of tech review too. And you can see now it shows here direct review completed. My locked sample has a lock on it. These numbers have been updated to reflect everything that we see here. So, for example, the call, the same case two, you, if you'll remember, had nothing that was likely pathogenic or pathogenic in the pre-classification. However, we reclassified one as being likely pathogenic. You can see the phenotype information that I added in is now here, and all of our pertinent results are showing. Again, I've generated a report that I can use, and I've saved that PDF in a different location where I'm saving all my reports, I might have uploaded into our LIS system as well. Okay, so with that, I would like to take any questions. Um, we'll go over to the polls in just a moment. And then while that's going on, please feel free to add any questions into the question panel, and I will answer them when our polls are completed. We'll now go on to the audience questions. The first question that we have is regards to the public data sets, so DGB, Decipher, and ClinGen. How often are these data sets updated? That's a great question. Um, so these databases are used in different formats. Um, DGB that we have shown here is a curated data set. It's derived from one that was published recently. Um, we have Decipher and ClinGen are um, made up of a variety of different subsets, so ClinGen has some fixed data sets as well as some um, updatable data sets. Those data sets are typically updated quarterly, and then we also update ours following that update. Um, so depending upon which data set it is, they're updated in a slightly different fashion, but we update everything quarterly so that it's the most current version that you can have available. The next question that we have 
is, are you able to see the whole genome view prior to report generation? And the answer to that is yes. Everything that I showed you in the report um, can be uh, visualized or included um, directly from your format. So our table can be exported directly out here um, using this export as CSV button. The whole genome view can be visualized if we just click this genome button here. Um, we do have the option of always changing the size of these windows if we want. And again, we can export this back out. Likewise, at the top, if we have a particular change of interest, for example, this one, we can take a snapshot of this and export it as well. So anything can be exported um, as we see fit or visualize. Everything that's in that final report is also in our main screen. Um, is anyone other than the director able to generate a report? Um, yes, um, there are going to be settings or guidelines depending upon who can do what. Right now, my settings are that pretty much anybody can do anything. Um, but yes, other people can generate the report if your settings allow it. Um, let's see what else. For an individual case, what is the minimum or maximum size cutoff to be further analyzed as being benign or pathogenic? These changes are going to be um, based on your individual lab discretion. Um, so in my example here, I did need it to have um, a minimum of 25 probes to be called, but this can vary depending upon what your lab standards are. Um, every lab is going to have a slightly different set of qualifications for their minimum and maximum requirements. All right, um, are there any top opportunities for free text inclusion? Yes, so in this notes section over here, we do have the option of, if we are in edit mode, we do have the option of adding in our own notes. So there's a plus sign right here, and I can add in a note here of whatever I want. This could be a description of why I classified this as such. This could be a note that there is a gene of interest that's in here. Um, anything that, that I want to include as a note, I can put it in here. Okay, our next question is, can you unlock a sample? Um, as I mentioned with, the, um, with the, the PDF generator, there are options where uh, there are user privileges that are assigned. So depending upon how your privileges are assigned, some people may or may not be to lock or unlock a sample. The lock is not set forever, so if you decide that you really didn't mean to, to lock it, you can undo it, but you do need to have the privileges to do so. Um, can data processed through other systems be viewed in NX Clinical? Yes. Um, also, can I look at my own custom arrays? So NX Clinical is allowed to take any array format that you have and bring it in here. This can include your um, Affymetrix, Illumina, um, Agilent arrays. It can also be custom arrays. So these can be the commercial or custom, depending upon what you have. But all of this information can be brought in. That being said, right now we are focusing just on copy number arrays. Um, there is no copy number from NGS currently in NX Clinical version 2.2, but version 3.0, which is coming soon, does also include NGS from CNV from NGS capabilities. Okay, do we have any other questions? In addition to or instead of ACMG guidelines, can I specify my own rules? Uh, yes, so if you have a different set of parameters that you want to include, if there are certain rules that you don't want to use or you want to adjust, you have the option to do so. These are guidelines, they are not set hard set, um, and so we have them as a starting point for you to use, but you can edit and change and make adjustments to best fit your current laboratory practices. One more question, can it analyze LOH? Um, yes, you can get LOH if you're using an array that will detect it. So um, if you're using a SNP array that has LOH, you will be able to see it here. Um, depending upon your settings, I currently have mine set to hide LOH if it corresponds to a copy number call. I didn't need to see the redundant call. Um, but if you have it showing all of those calls, you'll see them. If I have copy neutral LOH, it will show that as well. OK, any additional questions that I did not cover? Looks like that's everything we have. Okay, Shalini, is there anything else to, to cover? 
Uh, that's it for the questions. Thank you very much. And if anyone would like more information, please visit our website. Uh, click on the resources menu item. There are white papers, webinars, and additional resources there. Um, also, if you would like to continue this conversation on Twitter, please use the hashtag BioShare the knowledge. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar today, and we hope to see you at a future event. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.